This is Dateline News and Conversations. My guest tonight from Chiang Mai, Thailand, the Bumble Buddhist, my good friend, Eric Arno. Eric, welcome back to the show. Thanks. Great to see you again. Yes, indeed, it is. Um, first of all, uh, I think the last time that you were on the show, we really didn't establish much of your background at all. But tonight I want to start. Well, first of all, I'm going to say we're going to talk about the political stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. What's going on with the United States and China? They, they seem to be increasing the threats daily. We're going to talk about the view from Thailand on what the U.S. is doing in Ukraine and what the UK is doing. And, and you might as well talk about Anglo-Saxon. It's the United States and Great Britain behind all of this, sending depleted uranium to Ukraine. And now the UK sending cruise missiles. Mm -hmm. So those will be the serious topics. First of all, let's start with um, you growing up in Boston, Massachusetts, going to the historic Boston Latin School. Uh, let's pick it up from your youth, Eric, and mm -hmm. tell us about this incredible journey of searching uh, for reality and seeking truth. Right. <laughs> well, um, you know, it all started actually with a, um, a television show. Um, I was nine years old, and um, you know my father had died the year before, and that that uh, triggered a um, uh, a sense of uh, you know trying to under what is going on here? How could something so terrible happen that I lost my father? But um, but I had an innate curiosity as a kid anyway, and um, one time I was, I was watching television, and uh, this is the 1950s, 1957. And there was a, a PB, it was like a PBS, you know, P Corporation for Public Broadcasting, whatever it is, some TV show. And they were, it was a dramatization of a beatnik party. And of course, the beatniks were the precursors to the hippies. And they were the sort of the, the, the first real strong expression of counterculture in the United States, which was really starting to ask some serious questions about, you know, what is, what is the United States all about? Not that those questions weren't being asked earlier, but this is given more an, ex an expression of kind of outlandish behavior and so on. And, and um, so there's this guy there and he's, he's uh, wearing a beret. He's got a, a goatee, which in the 1950s, you, you had a crew cut, clean shaven, and a, you know, a, a nice shirt and a tie probably. And this guy's wearing a turtleneck jersey He's wearing a beret and he's got this funny looking cigarette and he's talking about Zen. And I'm thinking, Zen? What's Zen? So that happened and then years go by. I was, I was um, after school, I went into a, a, a little corner store and I saw a book on, on a little, um, one of those twirly um, bookshelf types of things where they have romance novels and cowboy novels and things like that, junk, basically junk. And there was this book called Zen Flesh, Zen Bones. And I said, there's that word. <laughs> so I, I got, bought the book and I was just completely floored by it because they were, the stories that they told were just opening up a whole world um, which was saying, yeah, it's okay to question. Um, so, you know, like the first story is, is very famous. You see it even in movies where a, um, a professor goes to a uh, Zen master and he, and he's, and he says, well, um, uh, and the Zen master starts pouring the tea and, the, um, and he keeps pouring it into this cup and finally the cup is overflowing and the professor says, stop pouring the water. You know, you're, you're, it is, the, the cup is full. And the Zen master says, just like this cup, your mind is full. 
full of your own ideas about what things are and how can I teach you anything about Zen unless you empty your mind and become open. So that was a real wake up call. Now I was in, as, as you mentioned, I was in Boston Latin School. And uh, the reason I was there was because I did well in my elementary school. And Boston Latin School was founded in 1635. It was the first public school, the oldest public school in the country. Uh, Harvard University was founded so that graduates of the high school could have a, a college to go to. I mean, that's how prestigious it was. And we and the um, uh, the Latin, you know, what Latin was like the foundational course which you had to take as a as a Latin school student. And uh, we had ancient history and there was other things. And I studied, to, you know, I studied German. I actually took one year of Russian, um, which I had to get discontinued because I ended up transferring out when my when we moved. But uh, in any case, I was at the school where we were taught, you know, really excellent English grammar and how to how to write clearly and carefully. And it gave me a basis for, uh, you know, critical thinking. And of course, when I started getting involved in Zen, this was something where we're talking about. This is that's what Zen is all. It's all about questioning. So uh, then I went on to university and um, I was uh, majoring in chemistry at the time. And then in my sophomore year, I had a, a mini nervous breakdown because I was in this play called Wojciech. It was a German, uh, German play produced in 1820 about this, this um, soldier who is basically treated like cannon fodder and uh, in a lab, he's basically a, a a lab specimen for these scientists and um, treated like crap. And I'm, I'm, so this is the beginning of my political consciousness where I'm thinking, you know, what is going on here? We're in this terrible war. They're using Agent Orange, they're using napalm. And I'm training in chemistry to learn how to make stuff that's gonna hurt people. And I just thought, I can't do this. So I dropped out of the, my chemistry career and I became a German major. And I thought, well, um, you know, as, a, as a kid growing up, growing up in a Jewish home, which had a, uh, you know, a history where my, I knew that my family in Europe had been killed, I just thought, I, I'm trying to, what happened? How did this country that was the the country that produced a Goethe and a Schiller and a Beethoven and all of these great scientists and so on, how did it go so wrong? That was the question that I asked. So I had this kind of feeling of, of um, uh, you know, questioning. And by the time I got out of the university, uh, this is 1970, the, the Vietnam War is at its height. The country is just going crazy. There's even talk of race war, you know, because the Black Panthers were, you know, talking about open rebellion. The streets were, cities were burning. And I just thought, this, I cannot be part of this system. This is just, this is crazy. It's so destructive. I don't want to have, I don't, this is a dog eat dog world and I don't want any part of it. I don't want to eat the flesh of dogs. I wrote that in a letter to a cousin of mine. So um, it, it turned out that while I was in the university, uh, this, this woman showed up. She was from, uh, from Berkeley, California. And uh, I was totally enthralled by her. She was gorgeous. And, and she had been to the first Zen monastery in the United States. So when I told her about my interest in Zen, she says, you've got to go to California and you've got to go to this monastery. So that was that fit in perfectly with my essential, you know, rebellion against the, the system itself, and so um, um, I, I after I graduated, I immediately went out to California, and uh, after about six months of kind of traveling around, um, I went and went to San Francisco, and and the Zen Center was there, and. Uh, they saw me and they saw that I was interested. They invited me to stay in the building and I stayed there for the next 13 years, uh, ordaining as a monk after about six years. 
so um, so I had this you know this kind of um, deep questioning attitude in my life um, at a certain point and I had and I basically threw myself into Zen as a monk I thought this is what I'm going to do this is my life's work and then um, there was a scandal where I discovered that the, not me but the whole you know, community discovered that the teacher was being abusive he was you know having sex with the students he was uh, spending huge amounts of money on himself and his family and at that point I thought I need to uh, this is not working and there was a there's a very famous um, text in Buddhism called the Kalama Sutta and the Kalama Sutta uh, tells the story of how the Buddha came to a village and uh, he's approached by the people and the people say you know Last last month, some guru came to our village and he said, "This is what reality is about. You should follow me because I can I can teach you." And then the next week, another guru came in and said, "No, no, no, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. You should follow me." And then the Buddha shows up and they say, "We're confused because one guy says this, one guy says that. What do you say?" And the Buddha says, um, "Do not trust authority. Do not fall for rumors." Um, do not go by what is conventional wisdom. You have to do your own research, dig into it, think for yourself, and decide if it's right, follow it. If it's harmful, don't do it. And this is like the most basic, you know, it's the essence of critical thinking, which was relevant then and it's more than relevant now. So um, I went into the I went into the financial business because I realized that I thought you know I'm totally against capitalism, but at the same time I'm I'm, I'm in this system I'm going to have to deal with it. So I went into the financial service business and uh, just to learn what it's about and to see if I could change anything from the inside. And I did that for you know basically I know, 15 say 16 years I was actively involved in it and uh, it wasn't satisfying to me I mean I was learning something but I'm not a I'm not a I'm not a real salesperson and this was you know, selling insurance and investments and that's just not my my style so um, and at that point of course uh, we're talking about the year 2000 and um, um, in 1999 I was, we were already, you know, having access to the internet. And I found this book called The Unauthorized Biography of George Bush Sr. And it talked about, it was like, it blew my mind because it talked about uh, the grandfather of George W. Bush, uh, who was a banker for the Nazis. He planned a coup against Roosevelt. These are not nice people. And um, as I, I dug into this, I just thought this there's something seriously you know, we're, we're, in, we're in serious trouble here. These are the kinds of people who have power. You know, where's this all going? Well, in, the, in 2000, there's an election that is obviously stolen. You have to be a, a fool not to see it. And then a few months later, um, the... the um, 9-11 happens and me with my conspiratorial thinking I'm thinking these guys these are these are the um, the collaborators with Nazis we know that the Nazis took control of the government in Germany in 1933 shortly after that a building is a there's a big catastrophe with a building and then there's a law passed which in, enables, it was called the Enabling Act. It was basically the, the equivalent of the Patriot Act. And I, I, I just thought the trajectory that this country is on is in, it's, it's just going into a very, very dark place. So in 2004, um, I, I helped out on the Dennis Kucinich presidential campaign and um, I knew that that was very quixotic and unlikely to produce anything. Of course, 
you know, his his the guy who was the anointed presidential candidate was um, uh, what's his name? Um, name escapes me at the moment. I don't know why. Um, John Kerry of Massachusetts, and John Kerry had been in the same fraternity as George Bush Jr. And this attorney is called Skull and Bones. And Skull and Bones is this black building in the on the Yale campus, no windows, nobody knows what's going on in there. It's basically a kind of a cult, and they pick people who are going to be very influential. They plant them in, in positions where they will have a lot of influence. And I just thought, if this is what's going on here, you know, this country is, I, I ask myself, is this country redeemable? Is the United States redeemable? And I thought, it doesn't look like it. And meanwhile, um, I have more of my own spiritual issues that I'm working on. And I thought, I'm just going to go to Thailand. It's a Buddhist country. I can stay in temples for minimal costs. I can cut my living expenses dramatically so that I'm not contributing to the system. And I'm, I'm, I just live very simply. And so I basically I escaped, and um, so I've been here in Thailand for since two thousand four. Okay, so oh, okay. oh, I should just mention that in two thousand seven, a friend of mine invited me to go to China, and I had always been interested in China because um, Zen actually uh, came from China. Uh, there was the Buddha who was the original teacher in India, and after a number of successive generations of teachers in India, one of them went to China, and the Buddhist teaching mixed with Confucianism and Taoism to create a kind of unique Chinese cultural iteration of Buddhism called Zen, which means meditation Buddhism. And uh, essentially what it is, it's a, it's a body of stories, dialogues between students and teachers and it's encouraging people to inquire into what is really what is reality okay so what have you been doing all these years in thailand have, have you been working are you retired what was going on well for the first you know 10 years i was basically sp spending um all my most of my time either traveling or just relaxing, uh, basically decompressing, you know, because um, you know people don't realize when, when you're when you live in the United States, uh, the um, there's a there's like an a um, there's a traumatizing effect that society has on the American consciousness. Their people just don't understand it. They're bombarded with propaganda. They're told lies continually so that they're in a state of cognitive dissonance. And um, and I, I and I at a certain point I thought, am I depressed because I'm mentally ill, or am I depressed because I'm in a toxic society? Well, I I thought I I think I'm depressed because I'm in a toxic society. So coming to Thailand was a way to just decompress from all that staying in temples a lot of times i meditated for many many hours days weeks months at a time and then i went to china and did that for for an additional you know like six or seven years staying in chinese temples and meeting these chinese monks who were these were zen monks these were people who had actually studied in the same tradition as the teachers that uh, the, the body of literature that I had studied as a monk in the United States. So that was a very um, nourishing experience for me. And I think it helped me to work through a lot of stuff so that um, now, um, you know, Caitlin Johnstone taught, had a very good article about this recently where she said, you know, when you're looking into this darkness, this, this really terrible situation, that we're in, it's easy to become depressed or angry or have these negative emotions. But if you can uh, learn to just face it with a certain state of mind and cultivate that state of mind, you can face this this um, this toxicity without being overwhelmed by it. 
And so I think that that my practice over those that over those years really helped me a lot. Now in 2014, I had a change of situation because I had a I had a knee injury. Uh, my my finances were not so great, and I thought, well, I think I maybe I need to uh, put some energy into getting the financial side of things together. So I started an Amazon business, uh, which is still going. It doesn't. It's not. I'm not a great businessman. It's not. I'm not. It's not making a lot of money, but it's it's interesting, and it sort of kept me engaged, and it helped me to uh, to um, you know stimulate the that aspect of my my brain. So that um, you know, a lot of people when you're people, they retire, they don't know what to do with themselves, and um, you see lots of these retired people. They basically hang out in bars and then they don't do anything with their life. So, um, and I'm not like that. So um, I did that. I, I trained physically. You know, I went to the gym. I go to yoga classes now. Things like that. So. Um, but in the past, uh, I would say concurrently in 2014, when I came back to Thailand from, from my last trip in China, um, I started reading a website called The Saker, uh, which was written by a, a, a Russian-American guy. He was, he's an ethnic Russian born in, in Switzerland, I guess. And he was talking about all things Russian. And I was seeing that there was a situation developing in Ukraine that looked quite serious. And um, I followed that as it developed and I could see, you know, this is a, we have a very serious situation developing here. And um, I followed it all the way through. And in the course of that, done a lot of research, found a lot of background material that is it, this is Western literature, which completely smashes the whole um, narrative that we're taught. So, you know, for example, we're taught, oh, the Russians didn't win World War II. So um, I went to I went to Russia uh, last summer. I was at a I was in the, the city of Volgograd, which was uh, the successor name to Stalingrad. Stalingrad was the turning point in the war. Two million people, one million Germans, one million Russians died fighting over the city, but the Russians won. And uh, FDR, the president, wrote a letter to the people of Stalingrad saying, you guys, you are great. You turned this war around. You were the first people to really defeat the Nazis and hats off to you. This is great. And um, uh, Churchill, perfidious creep that he was, also had to admit that, uh, uh, you know, this was a great victory. And the, the, the King of England at that time produced a sword, which is in, in uh, Volgograd, you know, commemorating this great victory, is honoring the, the, uh, the Soviet Union. So, so when, when I show stuff like this on my blog, um, it, it completely smashes this narrative that, oh, the Russians didn't really do any, you know, the, the Americans landed in, in Normandy and they won the war and, you know, it's, it's all ridiculous. So, um, so my job has been, what I'm trying to do now, Regis, is... Um, it's an it's an issue of consciousness. What we have, current, what what we're faced with, what humanity is faced with, is a crisis of consciousness. It is both spiritual consciousness and it's social and political consciousness. And um, there's always been a tension between these two, where the political people who are completely political say, "Oh, you navel gazers." You know, you don't know anything. You're just part of the problem because you're too self-involved. And the people who are, are involved in spiritual consciousness say, you know, you're neglecting the, the, the fundamentals. You know, if you don't have the fund, if you don't have your own head together and you're not peaceful in your heart, no matter what you do, you're going to cause more trouble because the, the 
fundamental toxic emotions of greed, hatred, arrogance, ignorance, confusion, are those affect everything that we do. And you can't have a successful political or social revolution unless you have people who are internally clear inside themselves. So the goal of my, what I've been doing in the past, especially I would say in the past couple of years is um, not putting so much emphasis into these uh, these more commercial things, you know, like my my Amazon business or my, I have a website that is it's it's about knee health because I have knee problems. It's an it's a nice thing to do, but it's not the big picture. And I'm more interested in the big picture. How how are we going to really turn the situation around? So that's basically what I've been doing. So, tell me about this business you have now uh, that you've been making symbols and right so um, yeah right so um i have i've written you know a number of articles and i continue to write articles uh, periodically i'm not um, i'm not writing an article every day um but i do have a website where i'm writing articles and i thought you know how much are people, people are not so much readers. You know, they, people are more graphically oriented. So I thought, you know, I can, I can put my website on Substack, like to Seymour Hirsch or something. Who's gonna read Eric Arno's Substack and donate to me? You know, it's ridiculous. But I thought what I can do is I can create t-shirts with a message and people can find those t-shirts and they'll say, and that, I'm hoping that the T-shirt will be a way to um, open up people's brains a little bit to things that they haven't really thought about. So I recently wrote an article called um, Question Everything on my website. And I talk about the Kalama Sutra, which I referred to earlier, and uh, talk about um, you know, the importance of critical thinking and so on. Um, so I created a T-shirt with a a like a picture of a, a Buddha face and it says question everything. So my idea is that if people buy this t-shirt and it says question everything, then when they're wearing that t-shirt, people will say, oh that's a really interesting t-shirt. And then the person who bought the t-shirt can get into a conversation with them and say, well what do you mean by question everything? Well um, did you know that the US blew up the Nord Stream pipeline? No, I nobody ever told me that. Well, question everything. <laughs> you know, uh, we have lots of. If there's any blessing to this situation we're in, it gives us lots of opportunities to question everything because everything that we're being told is is you know is you know fallacious. Um, so um, and there's other. I have other T-shirts. One of them is called um, "Give Peace a Chance," where I show people. It's like. Uh, uh, people uh, looking at a globe with a with a uh, white dove, and I put uh, "Give Peace a Chance," which is you know the famous uh, John Lennon uh, song. And uh, I have other you know other things. I have an, a little meme where it says "Free Your Mind." So I'm trying to uh, get some kind of awakening consciousness into people. Now, what's interesting is that um, I wanted to most of the stuff that I've done is is um, it's very, uh, very light in the sense of, um, uh, as opposed to dark, you know. Um, I want to kind of appeal to people, people's feel good sensibilities. So today I created a t-shirt um, based on Einstein's um, warning in which he said, the power, he says, the unleashing of the power of the atom has changed everything uh, save our modes of thinking, and thus we drift towards catastrophe. Um, and this, uh, I have this, this statement against a background of a nuclear bomb blowing up, which looks almost identical to the image that you have in your 
uh, 30 seconds to midnight you know, uh, thumbnail. It looks almost, it might even be the exact same picture. Well, I submitted that design to Amazon. Amazon rejected it. Interesting. So they can't, they, can't uh, they don't like Einstein telling people that we're, we're, we're fucked, you know, if we don't, if we don't start questioning what the hell is going on. Yeah. So I'm going to question this. Uh, are you, are you silk screening these t-shirts at home or, I mean, how, and where do you sell them? How do people get them? You, do you have to be in Thailand and go to some hippie shop or something to find these things? No, there's a lot of ways. T-shirt business is a huge, it's a sort of a sub, what can I say? It's a, it's a, it's a, um, what's the word? In internet, this you know, everything is on the internet nowadays. And um, there's many different, mo inter there's many different business models. Um, so one business model is called print on demand. And print on demand means that you can, you can um, upload your design to a company. It can be Etsy, it can be Amazon, it can be other websites. Uh, I'm just, I'm starting a web, I'm starting this on a website called Gearbubble. And uh, the reason why I picked Gear, Gearbubble was because um, Jackson Hinkle, who's a pretty well-known you know, YouTuber, uh, found that his designs were getting rejected. <laughs> so, so he found Gearbubble. I thought, well, if Gearbubble is, is willing to put Zs, you know, and, and uh, you know, Jackson Hinkle's, you know, kind of pro-Russians type stuff, then maybe there's a chance for me. So uh, I started an account with Gearbubble and uh, and I, I put the um, that uh, Einstein quote. Unfortunately, Gearbubble won't. They don't allow you to to make a very detailed picture. In other words, the, the bandwidth that they'll allow in an image is not so great. But at least it allows me to put give the message. And I have another. I just uh, uploaded another one called I'm I'm with Putin, uh, which if you go on Amazon and you look for T-shirts about Putin. There's not a single T-shirt which has anything nice to say about Putin. Putin's a thug. He's terrible. You know, it's, it's, you cannot say anything nice about Putin, and they allow it. You know, but if I put a T-shirt up saying I'm with Putin, my guess is that Amazon will will not allow it. So I just thought the hell with it. I'll just put it on Gearbubble, and it, what it is, it's a picture of a smiling bear, and it says I'm with Putin. You know, it's like. It's so like, how, how can people? How, where can they go? They, can they find your name and your brand on Amazon or this whatever it's, it is? T, tier bubble yeah, it, or tier bubble? right? It's um, at this point. I am in. Um, I am in uh, in the internet desert as as far as visibility is concerned. Because not only is the my content. Uh, probably undesirable to Google and Amazon and all these other creeps, but also because um, it, I'm so new at it that I don't have any presence. You know, so I saw somebody was talking about this. They said, you know, if you're going to have any visibility on Amazon, you have to have at least 100 sales. So, um, yes, Amazon is, we all know, we don't have to go into what Amazon is, but it is what it is. And, um, if people go into Amazon and they, they decide that they like some of my my um, designs, they can buy them and spread the word about peace and question everything and so on and so forth. And if they want to do if they want to have a Putin T-shirt, they can go to Gearbubble and I have other other T-shirts also on Gearbubble. They're kind of some of them are the same as Amazon, so they can go to Gearbubble and um, and order a Putin T-shirt. And you know, and I think I would, and this this kind of goes along with what Bruce um, uh, Gagnon was saying in his recent interview with you, where uh, they have a sign, you know, and they they have where this they have the sign and they go out every week and so on. And I thought, but if you have a T-shirt and you're wearing a T-shirt, you you're like a walking billboard, and that can hopefully if if people are wearing these kinds of t-shirts with these messages, it will start to 
encourage conversations about the issues that we all know need to be discussed. And so it's a very mundane, um, you know, approach to raising consciousness in a country, in a world that is, has a very low level of consciousness. So um, we're like, people are, most people are not going to read my 2000 word article about what happened at Stalingrad, you know, but they will see something that at least causes them to think, well, maybe I do have to question things, you know, in a visual thing. A, a picture is worth a thousand words. Yeah. All right. I want to shift gears with you with the time we have left. You've been an astute follower, observer, and researcher about what's going on geopolitically. But I want to focus now on what I think is really dangerous and extremely reckless. The United States continues to up the ante in Ukraine, sending them state-of-the-art stuff. Uh, the UK uh, has sent depleted uranium to Ukraine, and Russia has said, don't do that. Uh, nothing has happened yet. And then the UK just the other day said, we're going to send cruise missiles to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Eric, what do you make of this? Does Russia have a, a red line? Is it moving its red line with these increased threats? What, In your mind, what's happening? This is a very complicated situation, very confusing situation. And as you know, you and I both... Um, read assiduously, you know, different opinions on what's happening. Now, um, and I and I am fortunate because I do have, con I have not a lot, but I do have contacts with people in Russia, so I can get Russian opinions. And um, people have different opinions. Um, uh, a few months, when I, when I went to uh, Russia last year, my last day in Moscow, I met this guy who is a, uh, he's a businessman, and his wife uh, works as a CFO for some company. So these are quite intelligent people. And he and I talked for you know, several hours straight. And um, he's, ex he, you know, there's a lot of sentiment in Russia for the Soviet Union. People understand more and more just how badly they, they were you know, betrayed by their leadership. And, um, and he's very skeptical of, of the leadership even now. Um, he sent me an article um, several months ago talking about Putin and saying that Putin himself is very compromised because Putin is juggling, uh, on the one hand, the, the nationalists, and on the other hand, oligarchs who are basically in it for the money. They don't give a damn about Russia or anything. All they care about is themselves. And um, Putin is in the middle of this. And so uh, one of the reasons why it took him eight years to do anything about this whole situation in Ukraine was that um, he, he did not get enough uh, pressure from the people who felt that, they, that Russia needed to go in earlier. Um, and uh, there's other people who are talking about these same kinds of things. You know, there's a, and recently uh, Prigozhin who is the um, the uh, founder of the the, the uh, Wagner Group, uh, private military contractors, and he's basically saying um, there's some really weird stuff going on here. Uh, our, my efforts are being undermined, and um, it's causing you know real deaths of my my men here, and we don't like it. I don't like it, and he's in the most um, most vociferous uh, terms called out the Russian leadership, including the, uh, the Secretary of Defense, Shoigu, uh, and the, I think even uh, Gerasimov, who's the, um, the, the top uh, military guy. So you have that side of things. On the other hand, people are saying, well, you know, it may be that they're just doing this as a psyop against the Ukrainians to get them to attack so that Russia can smash them. So there's a lot of 
different, there's a lot of back and forth about what is going on. And it's, um, it's very difficult for me personally to say definitively what is actually going on because there's some very smart people on both sides saying different things. They're interpreting the same data. Everybody's, the data is all out there and people are just interpreting it differently. Now, um, getting to the issue of England, um, you know, England is a, uh, is a basically the people who run England uh, are and always have been psychopaths. You know, let's be frank about this. You don't, you don't have this little island and take over, you know, two thirds of the world um, lying your way into, you know, betraying people, dividing and conquering and so on, you know, creating opium wars, causing famines that kill millions of people due to starvation, not caring about it. I mean, there's a certain psychological mindset that infects the British elite. And as the British Empire uh, started to collapse of, of, on its own weight, um, they basically um, started feeding on their own people. So British society itself is in a state of, of um, disintegration, serious disintegration. And, um, you know, but they don't, you know, they don't care. You know, they're just, they're sending weapons to Ukraine instead of taking care of, there's something like there's more, um, there's more food banks in England right now than McDonald's restaurants, you know, which tells you everything. It's like 15% of kids are, are poverty stricken and, and don't have enough to eat. Uh, the country has basically turned into in what India was or has been, you know, for the past 200 years since the British went in and, and stole trillions of wealth, dollars of wealth from, they stole the diamonds and everything from, they, they, they destroyed India, they nearly destroyed China, uh, they've, they've harmed many other countries. So it's hardly surprising that when they're getting more and more desperate that they're losing control of the situation and Ukraine was their last chance to um, get control of Russia. Now people have to understand what, what is going on here and what is Russia all about? Well, in 1943, the United States created a, 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 a video called The Battle for Russia. This is a U.S. produced film that was explaining Russia. And it starts off by saying, Russia has been invaded time and again for centuries. And why? Because it's got a lot of resources. It's a, it is a physically very wealthy country. And the, the Russians as Slavic people are treated in, in the minds of the West, particularly the British and the Americans, the, the Slavic people are viewed no differently than the Native Americans were in the Americas. If, if there's a buck to be made, we just steal it by hook or by crook. We lie, we cheat, we steal, just like Pompeo said, you know, in his, uh, his, his uh, confession at a, at a um, conference that he was at. That's, that's how they think. And the problem with Russians is that, and, and other people, is that um, they're not, they just don't have that sort of psychopathic um, understanding. And so they, they get taken in. They're, na they're naive and trust too trusting. And uh, that has been a serious problem uh, for all of the world outside of Europe, outside of Europe for the past you know, 400 years. So that's what's going on with Russia right now. They're, they're basically learning to come to grips with the fact that they are under attack. They know that their country is slated for destruction. It's to be balkanized, broken up, the people driven into utter desperation and poverty, their, their population basically being depopulated, which is exactly what the Nazis were doing. That was their plan. And, um, and so the Russian people need to wake up and say, you know, we got to take this seriously. As far as depleted uranium is concerned, this is part of the same thing. You know, it's, you know, 
we're talking depleted uranium for people don't realize it. Um, it is not the uranium that is used to create nuclear weapons or to create nuclear energy. It is the it is the less radioactive, but still somewhat radioactive leftover of the extraction process to make nuclear weapons and to make nuclear energy. But it's extremely toxic and it is very heavy. So the US military discovered that because it is so heavy and dense, you can create um, shells out of it or bombs with it. And it has tremendous um, penetrating power. However, it's extremely toxic and it is a low grade um, you know, radioactive uh, element. And it's, there's something in, in um, atomic science called a half-life. Now, the half-life means how long does it take for something, half of something, to, to deteriorate into something less radioactive? Um, and um, de um, depleted uranium has a half-life of 4.5 billion years. Now, tritium, which is, the, is a, a, an isotope of hydrogen, has three neutrons instead of no neutrons, has a half-life of 12 years. It's, it's radioactive, it's dangerous, it's not good to have in your body, but depleted uranium lasts for 4.5 billion years. And that means that if the British are sending these kinds of weapons to Ukraine, they're going to create horrific birth defects and cancer, just as the US caused in Iraq, and in, and in Serbia. And the British are perfectly happy to have the same thing happen. If we can't get control of Ukraine, we're going to destroy it. And so this is a huge dilemma for Russia because Russia, the longer this war goes on, the more of this depleted uranium is going to poison Ukraine. And so what are they going to do? And if they you know, if they, you know, um, increase the tempo and act more, you know, proactively to, to really bring this war to an end and, and kick the, kick NATO out completely, um, NATO, has, you know, is going to be uh, escalating. So where's this going? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned some very important points, uh, one of which was, there's so much confusing information out there, uh, false news, that it's extremely difficult to know what's really going on. Um, this uh, this dispute between Prigozhin and Shoigu uh, is not good and has got people worried and questioning. Um, I was asking you if uh, R Russia really has a, a red line. I mean, the depleted uranium is in there, and Russia had said don't do it and warned Great Britain. And now Great Britain follows that up with cruise missiles. And, you know, when is enough enough? Uh, do you think Russia will run out of patience? Um you know, patience is certainly not a virtue in this situation because, as I say, the longer this war drags on, the more depleted uranium is going to be used and the more poison Ukraine is going to become. Um, so, you know, one would hope that um, that Russia would, you know, act to put an end to this. Um, but again, from a social point of view, is um, even if, you know, Again, um, Russia is hamstrung because, hamstrung because there are these basically traitorous elements within Russia, uh, especially within the business community and the oligarchs, who are perfectly happy to let this war go on and on because all they care about is money. And um, you know, there's more than more than a few people who are saying that this is a huge problem. You know, going back to the, the Soviet Union time. You know, the reason why, in my opinion, the reason why Stalin is so hated is because he knew what he was up against. And he said, 
you know, we got to we got to get rid of these blankety blanks. And so he did what had to be done to get rid of these people and, and uh, innocent people, you know, got caught in it, got caught in it. But this, Russia would never, Soviet Union would never have won World War II unless they had got rid of these interlopers. If you look at Western Europe, um, Western Europe fell very quickly to the Nazis because they were loaded with people who were sympathetic. Well, Russia has too many people who are either sympathetic or willing to look the other way, and that is causing, you know, that is what is basically um, hampering, you know, Russia's ability to prosecute the war as it needs to be prosecuted. So, if, you know, if the Russian people were really all in, they really understood, and, and as I've said to you, you know, in other contexts, I know Russians who are completely against this whole, this whole the, the special military operation. They, they don't understand what is at stake? And if they they really need to get it through their heads that this is real, this is a this is a world war. It is a war for the future of the planet. And if Russia loses, we are all basically screwed. So is Russia is the Russian military going to you know do what it takes to to um, you know, kick the kick NATO out. You know, uh, I, I talk with Putin extensively every day, and you know, we discuss this. You know, just kidding. How how am I supposed to know what's going on? You know, it's very it's a very confused situation, and um, um, <clears throat> it's unsettling. You know, but that's it is what it is. We just have to face it, you know, squarely and. Um, and just speak the truth about it to each other at, at a minimum and try and find our way through this. Yeah, I, I, uh, I agree with you. I think uh, Putin is compromised. Uh, he's got very powerful people on both sides, and it's not just the oligarchs uh, on that side. There's a lot of the Western-leaning liberals and intellectuals leaning towards the West. And then you've got just as many patriotic Russians, intellectuals, military people who are on the other side. And mm -hmm. I, 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 I do think, and I, I've hated to speculate about all this stuff, but that certainly seems what's going on. I've been pretty convinced that this has been Putin's problem for the entire 23 years that he's been in, in office. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to shift gears. We have a little bit of time left. Um, what's happening in Ukraine is extremely dangerous, as you pointed out, um, especially with the entry of depleted uranium and now cruise missiles. But at the same time, a half a world away, the, the United States is upping the ante, increasing the rhetoric and their actions on the ground. In, in Taiwan, they're doing the same thing to China. Mm -hmm. And Eric, what do you make of the situation that, that is going on in Taiwan? It, what do you see as the end of this? China is enormous uh, economically. China is really powerful politically. And China militarily... Uh, <clears throat> Is not a Johnny come lately. I've been reading where they have enough weapons, anti ship missiles, supersonic missiles that can eliminate however many fleets the United States has in the East China Sea. But how do you see this evolving simultaneously with what's going on in Ukraine? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, again, this is a two front war and. Uh, uh, it's very dangerous, you know, obviously, for, for the reasons that we've discussed. And it, it's not just about Taiwan. Remember, Australia is completely compromised. They're in the pockets. They're, they're, you know, you have on, in, the, in the West, you have Europe, which is totally compromised. They're all vassal states of the, of the empire. And in, in um, Asia, you have South Korea, Japan, 
uh, Australia. Uh, the Philippines just sold out. The, you know, this new president said, sure, come on in, build some more military bases. And the U.S. is trying to do the same thing in Thailand and uh, in Burma. So it's, um, it, of course, it's crystallized around, uh, around Taiwan. Now, I have a couple of friends from Taiwan. And uh, I just asked one of them, you know, what is what his his, his opinion is, and um, uh, he just says, you know, I'm getting, he's planning to get out of Taiwan. You know, he just says he's he's he says uh, he's pessimistic. He doesn't see a good end to this, and um, you know, the the best outcome for Taiwan would be for the KMT, which is the the um, just to explain to the to the listeners here, in 1949 there was a there was a civil war between the quote unquote nationalists who was led by Chiang Kai Shek, who was basically a, a a vassal of the United States and England, and the communists under Mao and Zhou Enlai and the, the Communist Party. Um, the communists won, however, the they they wanted to capture Taiwan, but they didn't quite have the, the ability to do it at that time in 1949. And then the Korean, excuse me, the Korean War broke out and the Korean War um, made it possible for the, um, for Taiwan to be even more um, taken under control by the United States. At a certain point in the 1970s, um, Nixon, came to the conclusion that he could play Russia and China against each other. So he created something called the One China Policy. And he gave China the, he granted to China the, um, the, the right to claim Taiwan as part of China. Taiwan is not Taiwan. It's the Republic of China. Its official name is the Republic of China. And they claim, technically they claim to have jurisdiction over the entire mainland China. Um, but as time has gone on, they've realized, well, I guess we're not going to be able to, that's not going to happen. But um, you create what they did, what the U.S. did is they created this, um, a Taiwanese nationalist faction, uh, which has taken significant control of the country. And um, they're talking about independence, you know, giving up the idea that they're, that they're part of China at all and just becoming Taiwan. Well, the KMT um, were traditionally completely anti-communist China, but there are indications that they're trying to have some kind of rapprochement with, the main, with mainland China, because the reality is that Taiwan has significant economic ties, economic business ties with China, not just economic and business, but cultural ties. Um, so there's, there's no really good reason for Taiwan to be separate from China. Um, and, and China doesn't want to invade, but um, the United States is, as you say, Regis is upping the ante. And recently, uh, the, the Americans, is, as is their want, said, well, if Taiwan gets, comes under the control of the mainland, we're going to have to destroy the semiconductor industry in Taiwan. They would basically blow it up, presumably. And if they did that, um, they would be de they would deprive China of this very, very valuable asset. Uh, the problem with this whole situation is that uh, the world depends on Taiwan's semiconductors and uh, the U.S. is, they think that they can um, steal the semiconductor industry from Taiwan and bring it to the United States. But the problem is, uh, if I may be so blunt, is that the American workers are stupid and undereducated and they don't have enough quality engineers and, and competent people to actually run a semiconductor industry. So, um, so the, whole, the whole project is untenable. 
and the United States, they're basically committing suicide, whatever they do, they, they just don't see that they're committing suicide. If they attack China, that means that Amazon, Walmart, and every other retail business in the United States is going to it's going to be empty shelves because China makes everything, and because the U.S. gave away their manufacturing capability to China, um, it's in America is basically an industrial desert. So you know you can't have an economy based on on um, um, restaurants and and um, salespeople. You know, these are not, it's not a real economy. So it's a, it's a completely self-destructive path that the U.S. is on with this, uh, this ensuing, or it's a, it's a, it's a soft war. It is a war against China that's going on right now, but uh, it's, um, you know, how far they're willing to push it is very hard to say. And I'll just finish off this part of it by saying that, uh, I just saw that um, you know China had this weather balloon. If it, it, it goes out over the United States, the U.S. makes a big deal out of it. Oh, it's, they're spying on us. Those these evil Chinese. You know, the, there's the yellow peril. You know, those those chinks with their slitty eyes and their yellow skin. You know, they're you can't trust them. They're bad. And um, um, and recently, um, uh, Jake Sullivan said. Jake Sullivan had some kind of contact with them, and they said, uh, "Well, you know, we probably should uh, we're, let let's put this balloon thing behind us and kind of get things back on track." And China had some conversation with them. They said, "Well, it, it's good you're heading in the right direction, but if I were the Chinese, I would say that's all very nice, but no more weapons to Taiwan. Get it?" Will they do that? Probably not. They're going to just keep pushing and pushing. And so we'll see what happens with, with uh, Taiwan. And the Taiwanese are, you know, they're, unfortunately, they're playing, there's too many Taiwan, Taiwanese who have drunk the U.S. Kool-Aid um, and they're willing to go along with the U.S. Yeah, pretty high stakes gamble. Eric, um, where can people find you? What, what's your website? Okay. Um, my website is uh, www.bumblebuddhist. It's like bumblebee, but it's bumblebuddhist, B-U-M-B-L-E, dot com. And you can read my articles there. Um, you can find my uh some of my t-shirts at um, gearbubble.com and um, probably you have to put links to the to the specific product in the description or something I don't know how to do that and um, as I say my my these products are uh, they're on Amazon they're on gearbubble but uh, they're they're very hard to find even if I type in the exact name of the product um, they often don't appear or you have you really have to look for them basically so um, yeah well eric i want to thank you for uh coming on the show tonight always good to see you hope you get a chance to come back to russia i know you're thinking about it right yeah that's uh there's a, a fair possibility that i will do that this summer i'm looking into it mm -hmm.